This is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. Hey guys, this is Lane with the Simple Passive Casual Podcast. Please go to the website and sign up for the Hui Deal Pipeline Club. And also sign up for the email updates that go out with the website. Some of these things... I put on there don't really go well in the podcast form, such as the uh, the tax charts and all that stuff I put out recently. So make sure you sign up for those two lists. And uh, today I've got my friend Andrew Campbell on the line. He is a Austin native. It's Austin, Texas. He is a multifamily investor. And Andrew, how, how many units you've got today? Because I've got an old file, probably. Yeah, uh, Lane, I'm happy to happy to be here. Look forward to, to chatting with you. Um, today we've got uh, I've got seventy six units that kind of was our initial foray into real estate, and it was something that I built up about started about six years ago. Started buying in Austin and San Antonio. Kind of fell in love with the business and and then saw the the power and the potential of it. And then moved into syndication and larger deals. Um, we've bought a 202 unit uh, in June. That's in Fort Worth, Texas, and we actually close on a 192 unit in a couple of weeks in San Antonio. First question we always ask people who come on here, Andrew, is how much simple passive cash flow are you making today, and how are you doing it? Well, simple passive cash flow is kind of an interesting term. You know, I think w- when I first got into to real estate, it was all about creating passive cash flow. And we were buying, you know, duplexes and fourplexes with the sole intent of, you know, kind of on the side, let, let's build up some income. Um, you know, what, what we're doing now with, with the syndication business, um, you know, as, as a full-time job, I don't necessarily call that passive because it's, you know, I'm very, very active in that business. Um, and I, I love it, and, but it takes a lot of time. And, and, you know, it's, to me, not the definition of passive uh, to me, the, the the rentals that we have on the side, that initial 76 units, I would call as more passive. Um, and we've, we make enough on that that, you know, feels like replaces probably half of a salary and, um, you know, gives us a, a good nest egg every month um, to where we can you know, have the flexibility to focus on that syndication business. Yeah, I think that's a, a key component to really focus in on because a lot of people, they hear the syndicators that come on, the, the guys doing the deals, they hear this huge unit count, but it's a switch in the business, right? It's what you're doing is a business. And it, it's great to hear that you had a such a number, like whether it was $1,000 or $4,000 before you branched out into your seemingly higher riskier business that you're doing today, instead of just living off the passive cash flow. As a, as a passive investor starting out? You know, it really, it was, the intention was always to create passive cash flow. And that's what we started out for. You know, if I kind of rewind a little bit, I was working a corporate job. I have an advertising degree, was working in ad agencies, you know, spent some time in San Francisco and Minneapolis. Um, and I got a phone call one day that my dad had had a massive stroke. So I moved back to Austin to kind of help take care of him. And you really just decided, look, you need to need to kind of figure out a different path. Um, you know, don't want to have a, a, a job and work for somebody else full time. Um, I want to go create passive income. And that's when we started buying rentals. And that's what kind of propelled us into it. Um, as we've kind of learned the business, and I say we, kind of my brother and I were doing this um, together in cooperation. We would buy, you know, we had some single families. We had some duplexes. We had some fourplexes. And we just saw that, you know, the fourplexes outperformed the duplexes, the duplexes outperformed the single family, um, that it made sense to kind of look for, for bigger unit counts. I think the other thing that, that happened, and as we saw, is this, you know, this passive income was coming in. And I don't know that it's ever passive. You know, we were managing a lot of these ourselves. You know, we were actively out looking for deals all the time. So we were spending a lot of time doing it. But we really saw that we just had this intense passion for the business. We fell in love with, with the real estate business. And what started out as just wanting to do this on a passive um, side side hustle basically became sort of a full time obsession. And as it was more and more of of, of my interests in, in looking at how do we do this you know, more full time and, and create some of that flexibility, that's when we switched gears and we started looking at at syndicating some of the bigger deals. And I think you're absolutely right. It, it was it's not a passive thing at all for us anymore. Um, it's very much full time, and I, I probably work more hours now than I ever have. But I do have flexibility in you know where I'm working and how I'm working, and I can construct my day around you know what I want to do with my family and my kids. 
but it, it's it's kind of funny that it started out to be passive and it's now no longer passive. Kind of sounds like a big uh, pivot moment in your life, going from a passive investor to being the guy. Anything when you know maybe when you're working your job that happened that really pushed you forward. Uh, I think of just more of a gradual thing. You know, we we you know bought a duplex and we bought a fourplex. I go back to the very beginning. You know, within call it a month of each other. Once we decided we were going to go, you know, pursue this this real estate thing, and over the next you know three or four years, as we built that you know four units and six units into seventy six units, it was just a more of a, a passion and interest thing. And every day that we every time we added another property and you saw the returns and you saw the, the, the sort of future growth potential, the interest in the day job started to wane. And it just became like, that was just getting in our way. Like I had to go do this thing that I didn't care about anymore that I didn't really like doing. I knew I wanted to go do more and more real estate because it, it, I just, I, I love it. And I see the potential of it for myself and what it was doing in our lives. And I wanted to share that with you know my friends and family. And that's kind of what propelled us to make the decision to leave our full-time job, to go start doing the syndication full-time. It wasn't necessarily one specific moment. It was just kind of a gradual thing that, that happened you know, once we actually took the action to start investing. Was there anything in particular that made you find a believe that you could do it? You know I mean? Because a lot of people, they understand it. They, uh, they see the people around them that can do it, uh, you know, but they, they just don't think that they can, you know, be the guy who leads a, a larger deal or even pick up that first rental. I mean, was it, was it something from your day job? Like, I mean, heck, I'm a corporate America. I'm doing pretty well. What makes me think I can't do that? Or is it, you just did it just one step at a time? Yeah, it, it was more of like, why, why can't I do this? I mean, if I go back to the beginning again, you know, we, we had a very strong why, you know, we'd seen our, our, we're still helping kind of take care of our dad today. You know, he, he went through this kind of traumatic event and wanting to be able to, to have some more time and flexibility to, to spend time with him, help take care of him. That was why we got into the business. You know, now I had a, a friend who's a, a broker and a realtor that had, you know, a handful of, of duplex rentals he really kind of helped us get going and talked us through, here's what you need to do. And he had a deal. He actually sold us the first couple of deals and I kind of drafted off of his playbook. He should, you know, this is what you want to buy. This is what's going to, the cash flow is going to look like. He had, you know, property manager friends and, and, you know, the, the contractors in place that we were able to kind of draft off his system. And so it was more of like, we had this really strong, why we wanted to go do it. Let's go figure it out. And, and there's no reason I can't do it. And then as we figured it out and kind of learned the business and we intentionally did some things to, so that we knew we would learn the business. For example, we, we managed all the properties ourselves to start out with number one, give us a little bit more extra cash flow, but also really help us learn the business. You know, we would go do a lot of our general contracting work and as we were fixing some of these duplexes up and be really actively engaged on sites so that we were forcing ourselves to learn it because we didn't have any experience. We wanted to kind of figure it out on the fly. So I think it was the, once you actually got over the hurdle of, of buying the first property, um, that's what propelled our growth. And, and I mean, I remember very, very vividly, the first property we bought was a fourplex and we closed on the property and I went over there that day and I had a letter with me that said, Hey, I'm your new landlord and here's how we're going to pay rent. And just kind of, here's my contact information. And I was terrified. Like I pulled up to this property. It was sort of a C plus class deal. I was like, Oh my gosh, what have I done? I don't have any idea what I'm doing, how to talk to these people. You know, it, it was, it was all figured out on the fly and it was more of just a, you know, hard headed determination to go figure it out than it was uh, any one specific thing that I felt like I could do it. For folks like yourself that kind of take that step to the next level, I mean, there's what I usually see is there's some kind of skill set that you have that you've really leveraged it. I mean, you've learned how to do the thing, but then mm -hmm. there's something that really takes takes you to that next level. Anything from your marketing background that you really draw upon that kind of really gives you that edge? Yeah, I, I leverage, you know, my background daily and, and I write a lot about it, you know, and, and at this point I've got a partner who, you know, has a very complimentary skill set to, to myself, you know, me with a kind of marketing advertising background, I'm always thinking about, you know, how do we brand ourselves and our company and, and there's a lot of different facets of that, you know, who are we to potential investors, who are we to brokers and folks that are going to help us get deals who are we to our tenants you know how are we going to look at our property how are we going to brand the the property and, and who are we going to be attracting from a tenant base so i'm constantly thinking about you know the, the marketing aspect and, and what's the story around this property you know what's the story around why we're picking it up and why we like it 
what's the story around the market. And I've got a partner that's very focused on the, the due diligence pieces of it, the contracts, the construction management, a lot of the, the, the details when I'm thinking about kind of that bigger picture in, in the marketing. So I, I think everybody, you know, is going to fall back on their strengths and what they know. And, and, you know, in our relationship, my strengths are the marketing and, and kind of the big picture storytelling and his strengths are the, the details of, you know, contracts and budget management and construction and, and those mesh really well. Um, so mine is typically more marketing focused just because that's where my, my background is. It's a real left brain, right brain thing. And it's hard to switch back and forth. Just take my podcast, for example. I mean, just doing the marketing and doing all the postings, it's totally different than content creation, but you've got to do both. And a podcast isn't quite as important as managing this apartment deal. So, I mean, I can juggle it and do it okay. But um, yeah, you definitely need to specialize when you get to that higher level, which you've done. Andrew, what's your uh, worst life business moment and what did you do after? What was the lesson learned? You know, I, I think that the real pivotal moment for us, I, you know, kind of referenced my dad getting sick. That's a day that really kind of changed, you know, the trajectory of, of really my life. You know, I was, I grew up in Austin and I always wanted to get back here someday. Um, I wasn't planning to come back. I was 27 when he, when I, when he got sick, when I moved home, I wasn't planning to move home, you know, that day or, or within the next five years. But without that experience of kind of going through that, um, I wouldn't have gone down the path of starting to invest in, in real estate and I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, you know, if I look back five years ago, six years ago, we first started buying, you know, duplexes. I, I wouldn't have told you I'd be sitting here, you know, today on a podcast with you, Lane, talking about apartment syndication. I didn't really know what that was. That one day and kind of moving moving back really propelled this whole shift in kind of life's direction and, and what, what we're up to today. What is your uh, simple passive cash flow that you're, number that you're shooting for? And imagine you had two times that. What kind of ideal day would that be? Is it, are, you, are you living it today? You know, I, I think the day wouldn't change a whole lot for me. You know, obviously, like, number one, I, I just, I love this job and I, I love the business of, of real estate and, and finding deals. I love, I love looking for, you know, good value add and finding good value add deals. I love the kind of the thrill of the chase. I don't think that that changes a lot. You know, I'm, I'm able to work from home a lot if I want. I've got, I'm running around meeting people. I, I love talking with people. You know, I think my, one of my favorite things about this job is, coffee meetings, you know, conference calls with, with investors, with brokers. I'm kind of a people person and this job allows me to do a lot of that. So I don't, I don't think I, my day looks much different. You know, I might take more time off where I'd have, you know, maybe it's one day a week that I can kind of dedicate to just hanging out with my kids more or, you know, getting to golf a little bit more things like that. But day to day basis, I, I just love what I'm doing. I love the business. I don't think my calendar looks a whole lot different. You're a younger guy and it kind of seems like people have got this thing in their head about right now you're either in the capital growth mode or you're kind of in the cruise control mode. Do you ever see it that way? Um, I'm always in growth mode and I think that's just kind of the way I'm wired my personality a little bit, you know, whether it's, it's business or, or life or, you know, golf game. I'm, I'm a big golfer. I'm always trying to get better at, at what I'm doing. You know, again, I think when we, when we bought our first rental, I knew we were, I was never going to be a guy that just bought like one or two rentals. You know, it was always going to, the, the goal was how fast could I get the next one? How much capital could we save to, to go buy the next one? So it's always been about growth. Um, you know, and I think maybe at some point that changes, but it's, it's not a, I think it's, it's more personality driven than it is numbers driven. You know, there's not a, there's not a, a number in my head that if I get to that, I'm done because then what would I go do? I am, you know, I am relatively, young. I'm 37 years old. You know, what am I going to go do um, that's going to be this much fun, that's going to give me an outlet to harness you know, my creativity to, to my people's skills? It's just something I really am passionate about, I really enjoy. It's not about a number. It's, it's more about a, a mindset of, of growth and abundance. So speaking about growing, what is a two-week experiment and a six-month project that you're working on? I mean, because the mark of a high performer that you're always growing in, it, it's nice for the folks that hear like, what you're working on these days. You know, uh, I'm... More kind of personal growth stuff is, is kind of where I'm, I'm challenging myself. You know, right now I've got on my whiteboard behind me, you know, monthly goals for, you know, how many miles am I going to run this month and how many push-ups and sit-ups am I going to do? So just simple, you know, kind of health activities that I'm doing in the morning to, you know, keep my body sharp, keep my mind sharp and, and get the self-discipline, you know, and I've set a, a number that basically requires me to get up and run three miles every single day for the month. 
Um, so that, that's kind of you call it a two week experiment. It's more of a, a month experiment. And every month I'm, I'm pushing that number up a little bit, but it's, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in it. You know, if I miss a day that I've got to go met, make that up, uh, you know, with a longer run someday. Um, so more kind of, that's a, it's a physical challenge, but it's also a discipline, you know, do I have the discipline to go do this thing every single day, uh, to meet that goal at the end of the month. What about a longer project, something that you're gearing up for maybe next year? Yeah, you know, longer kind of on, on the business side, you know, one of the one of the goals we've got in the next, you know, kind of six months um, is to go get, you know, two or three more more deals done. And, you know, don't know where those come from. Um, you know, I think that the caveat to that is we're very, very conscious of where we're at in the market cycle and making sure that we are buying good deals, you know, not just doing deal to, to get it done. Um, I think that the, the, the benefit of where I'm at and having you know some passive income from my, uh, my my rental portfolio is we don't have to go get a deal done just for the sake of putting food on the table, uh, but that is a goal we've got is to go you know find two or three deals that that make sense and just continually kind of you know mining for for good properties and, and good opportunities. Yeah, and you know what I liked about when I saw your guys underwriting was a lot of the conservative estimate. You know, just the other other week I was looking at another guy's deal. And they were using these just ridiculous underwriting. I mean, it was they were using the fifty percent rule, but it was only like it was a small building, and and the expenses per unit were like two thousand dollars a unit. I'm like, come on, man, like that's ridiculous. And they're using like one percent expenses increases over the year. Yeah. And um, you know, it wasn't keeping up with the pace of inflation, and the rent increases were like two point five percent in like a tertiary or even smaller market i'm like man this is like is this what people are doing just to get getting deals I, I done? i think there's i think there's a lot of that out there um you know and i think we we talk a lot when we're meeting with you know investors or, or equity partners you know everybody says they underwrite conservatively but what does that really mean what does that really look like and i think you know we look we, we offer on deals we look at deals all the time and and don't get them because you know somebody's paying we, we lost a deal last week actually where somebody was willing to pay uh, gosh, th- almost three quarters of a million dollars more than we were on a, you know, let's call it a $17 million purchase price. Um, that's a, that's a huge number and there's just no way that it worked for us. And, you know, so I think it's, you've got to be disciplined in your underwriting. You got to have good, smart decisions. And I think it's even more important as you start to do syndications and you're, you're using other people's money, you've got a responsibility to your investors, you know, and, and ourselves. I mean, we're, we invest in our own deals. So making sure that, that we actually believe we can hit these, that we're buying them in the right location and that we think we can hit the rent increases and the projections that we're underwriting to. And there's a lot of folks that, that are, I think they're getting, you know, a little loose with, with some of their numbers. And, and there is, you know, to your point, just the, the, uh, the mentality, I've got to get deals done. Like, look, I want to go get two or three deals done, but only if they make sense, only if they're the right deals. Um, and so we just got to stay disciplined in, in our underwriting and our approach and know that, you know, if somebody does go win a deal and, and they've got numbers like you suggested, well, if and when the market corrects, you know, they're going to be in trouble and we'll be able to go to pick that, that asset back up from them on a discount because they won't, they won't be able to make their numbers. Yeah, you know, it just seems like a trend in this seller's market where all the passive investors are in a way entitled or spoiled to that 100% in, in five years or the, the 17 to 20% IRs. And it seems like a lot of the deals that are being underwritten, they're bending all those little uh, nuances that get up to that magic number. But it's kind of like the turnkey homes. I mean, everybody wants the 1% rent to value but I'm seeing those same properties that I bought a few years ago that were like 1980s build, 1990s build in uh, you know 20 minutes from the city center. To get that same 1, 1% rent to value ratio, you're having to go an hour outside the city and it's like 1960s properties. And to get the numbers, they're, they're paying the price, but they don't realize it. I, I think it's happening you know, everywhere. I mean, it, we've, we've had a, a good long extended run here. You know, when we first started buying here in Austin, you know, Austin's had a, a great run, uh, tons of appreciation. That was like three years ago. We just felt like, man, it doesn't work here. You know, I can't, I can't buy something that cash flows. If we bought a a, a fourplex, you know, for, like our first deal, for example, was two hundred sixty five thousand dollars, and the rents were you know, the day we bought it were around thirty one hundred. 
so it was you know we beat we beat the one percent rule um and it was it's been a fantastic property well now the properties on that street are, are going for a lot um, over half a million dollars so on the one hand you know our property is now worth double that's fantastic and on the other hand i'm thinking who is buying these properties the rents are still you know not four thousand dollars a month yet so it's it's purely people are purely banking on appreciation and maybe they're going to get saved and the market will continue to go up and they'll be fine. But it's not a game that, that we're willing to pay uh, to play. And, and we started buying in San Antonio because of that to where we could find, you know, closer to the city center, good cash flowing deals that kind of met, met the metrics we've got. And, you know, it's certainly something we continue to do in the syndication business is just finding deals that are in the right location that are, you know, we feel like there's there's pop, pops and and I think some cities are just you know too hot and too priced out where you know like Austin's a good example I look every single day I live here and I've got good relationships with brokers but I just I don't see anything that that makes sense you know we bid on deals and, and are you know just not even not even getting calls back because there, there are people are willing to bank on that appreciation but it's a cool place to live right it's a great place to live. I mean, I love it. It's, it's fun. It's beautiful. It's uh, you can probably tell it's allergy season right now. I'm a little stopped up, but um, it, it's a great place to be, but it's uh, it's tough to cash flow. That's for sure. Not being one of the big boys investing quite yet, AKA the accredited investor in the eyes of the SEC, it's tough to find good options for investing. But then I started investing in the American Homeowner Preservation Fund, or AHP Fund, which is crowdfunding the mortgage crisis in America. The fund collaborates with existing homeowners to keep them in their homes. It's a way to make great returns while feeling good about making a social impact. After investing myself in the fund, it was awesome when they approached me to become an advertiser of the company. You can start investing with as little as 100 bucks, and if you want the free Burn Zone book, please send me an email to lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. So something that you recently changed your mind on, I run into all the time where I'm kind of, my ego says like, that's not a good idea. But then there's been a couple of times where I've changed my opinion on things. This is kind of something that's happening, you know, real time that, that we're talking about. Um, we kind of built up our, our business and in, in, in brand, you know, back to my marketing background around Texas and buying deals in Texas. And obviously, you know, big fan of, of, of Texas markets in general. I think the fundamentals are, are there. Uh, we're starting to talk about looking outside of Texas. And, you know, we've, we've got a deal under contract that we close in San Antonio next week. We've talked about Austin, you know, how, how hot it is. Uh, Dallas is, is very hot, very competitive. Are we, we're starting to, to have that conversation and change our mind around, do we look outside of, of, of Texas markets and where else would we look? Um, so I think that's something that's a little bit, ongoing for us, but, but definitely starting to, to change our mind a little bit around um, just being exclusively focused on, on Texas markets and where, where should, else should we be looking? Well, the, the whole wild horn branding kind of goes well with Phoenix. So maybe that's a sign, huh? You know, it, it could be, I mean, it's, it's, and it's funny, you know, even more with, with the wild horn, you know, my brother went to the university of Arizona, which is where the wild, the wild cats, that's where wild came from. So he's got a, we, we've got a little bit of Arizona connection. Yeah, but I mean, it's no secret. People are moving to where the sun belts and where it's warm. Yep. That's where all the population growth is down south. Across the board. I think, you know, the, the places that we're going to investigate, you know, Phoenix is certainly on that list. Uh, you know, Dow, the, the, the Texas markets will continue to be a focus. You know, Kansas City, Oklahoma City, uh, you know, Jacksonville, Atlanta, um, you know, just, but you're right. Everything, everything that's in the, in the sun belt and, you know, warmer weather. It's where people seem to be moving. Yeah. What's your take on Indianapolis? I keep hearing that one, but it's kind of an outlier up north. Yeah. To be honest, I haven't, I keep hearing about it too. And I know, you know, people are, are doing deals there. Um, it's not something I've really investigated. You know, one of, one of my rules is, is it's got to be a two hour nonstop flight for me. You know, if we're going to go start, start going places, you know, we're going to be spending a lot of time there looking at deals, building relationships and, that's not a place that I can get to from Austin in two hours. So it's just initially not on my, my radar. All right. I mean, I think that's how a lot of these deals have been failing that I've been seeing is that the, uh, the leads aren't there physically. I mean, there's got to be at least one guy boots in the ground. That's, that's what you're kind of doing on that San Antonio deal. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I, 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 I posted an article about this recently about, you know, sort of investing with a local. And, you know, if I look at, at, 
the market knowledge that I've got, you know, in Austin and San Antonio, um, it, it's, it's critical to us being successful, you know, being able to, to have, have, you know, meetups and, and meetings face to face and, you know, being able to tour deals. I think, yeah, when we, if, and when we decide to expand to another market, we will do that with a partner who is there and local and has, you know, just an immense amount of local market knowledge and expertise and, and connections, because you've got to have, you got to have somebody on your team that really knows and understands the nuances, you know, on a sub market by sub market basis, more than you can just get looking through a co-star or a Reese report. Right, right. They may not necessarily know how to turn around a 250 unit apartment, but the eyes and ears is the really important part. Absolutely. So something that you recently thought about burning your cash on for time savings or a improvement in quality of life. There's a, there's a couple of things, um, you know, as we're kind of getting through, through this latest deal, um, you know, some, some of the, I don't know what the right word is they're, they're super important tasks, but some of the administrative work around, you know, making sure all the legal documents with investors are done and all that the, the funds have been wired incorrectly, obviously really important. You want to have that, that personal, you know, face-to-face -face touch with your investors. Um, but something that we're, we're looking at is there, are there better systems that we could go invest in or, you know, virtual assistant or, or somebody we could add to the team that would make that a little bit smoother, a little bit better, um, for, for everybody, you know, where, where it's like their full-time focus, um, it's something that we're definitely looking at. Um, and then, you know, looking at, at, as we looking to expand, you know, additional analysts and underwriters that, that can help us get through deals faster and kind of do that initial cursory, hey, does this deal make sense? Um, are, are two things that we're going to go invest in to continue to, you know, increase our velocity to finding the the very best deals, you know, just because the market's so tight, um, it, it requires you digging a little bit deeper than everybody else. Anything on the personal side that you bought over for you at some time? <laughs> Not really. I feel like I've, you know, on, on the personal side, you know, I've, I've got a, a pretty good balance with, you know, spending some time with, with my family, we've got two young kids. And, you know, I, I think the big thing I did there was, you know, leaving the corporate job, you know, and, and being able to, to build my life and, and my day around, you know, what our schedule is. And like a good example on Thursday, I've got, I'm going to read to my daughter's first grade class, you know, I didn't have to check anybody's calendar or, or you know, take a, a long vacation lunch or anything. It's just, I get to go do that. You know, and I think that that's been a, something that I'd, I'd never I'll always kind of remain grateful for and, and keep front of mind that like I have the flexibility to do that. Um, but I think, you know, it certainly benefits my personal life being able to, to do things like that. Rules around like how many hours you work? No, you know that, and that's, 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 I just, I've worked until the work gets done. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, it's, it's a full time, full day at, at, you know, kind of in the office and then spend some time with, with the kids and, you know, eat dinner with them, do some play in the, in the backyard, get them down. And, you know, there, there's usually two, three, four nights a week that I'm back, you know, following up on things, you know, just kind of constantly just, you know, the life of, you know, this, the life of the kind of entrepreneur and with, with lots of different things going on, there's, there's always things to do. So I don't, I need to get better about that, but I don't have any hard and fast rules about, you know, how much I work. Yeah, because a lot of the guys are, uh, you know, working the day job and trying to do it as a side gig. I tell them, you know, just do an hour or two at the end of the day. Just yeah. And that. I mean, I always said, look, when I was, when we had, when I was still working a corporate job, like I had two full time jobs, you know, real estate investing was a full time job. And it was, you know, between looking for deals, managing the portfolio we had, and it was, you know, it was a decent sized portfolio. So there was always something happening. Uh, somebody was moving out or some, you know, unit needed work. It just wasn't, I never felt like it was a side hustle as much. It was just a second full-time job. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, that I was able to, to kind of get out of the corporate job as fast as I did is that it, I, it wasn't a, I didn't, I didn't put a limit on it as far as I'm only going to spend, you know, two hours on it. It was just like, look, I want to, we want to grow it and we need to, you know, take care of the stuff we've got. So it often was a, that nighttime job. Yeah, I mean, I, I say the two-hour thing, but that's definitely not my case. <laughs> I just yeah, say I mean, that just so this, I don't get fired. <laughs> just this podcast takes, I mean, that takes a lot of effort. You know, this is kind of a message out to the, the newer folks. They're looking at the seller's market, and there's everyone's telling them that every market cycles 8 to 12 years, and we've been, it's a long time away from 2008. If you were starting out again today, and you only had maybe one rental, or you didn't have anything, what would you be investing? What would be your, your 
your outlook. I mean, you want to get a deal done, yet you don't really know too much. And maybe a turnkey rental might be the only thing that you can go after based on your experience. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the the place you, you've got to look right now is is where value add deals, you know, places that, that you can go find, whether it's a single family or a duplex or, you know, investing in a syndication that, that they are finding ways that they can immediately increase the value of the property. That if you just rely on the market, I think you're right. You know, nobody really knows what's going to happen. Is it going to slow down? Uh, and when is it going to slow down? But if you're, if you can find something, be a part of something where there is, immediate value that can be added to the property, you know, maybe on a small scale, maybe that's converting a garage into an extra bedroom um, or, you know, it's just a, an older dilapidated property that's updating. I think it's, it's finding places where you can force value on the deal once you buy it. All right. Like if you're buying turnkey today, you're definitely paying above retail and you're going to be under underwater. That correct? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that's what we're looking for in, in the larger space as well. You know, it's, it's value add deals that, you know, we, we know they've, there's a proven model there, but the locations is such that we can, we can upgrade the interiors and get, get additional rent, but we can also go implement other value add programs and know that you know, we're going to create new income streams, new revenue for that asset. And, you know, even if the, the rent growth is, is pretty slow and, and significantly lower than what it has been, we've created enough value that, that we'll still, you know, have returns to give to investors that it's going to be a good investment. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of guys, they, they miss the nuance of the, the value add. They, they think of it as a property that's maybe 30% occupied or 60% occupied, a pretty distressed property. But I think when you and I talk about it, we're talking about it's still going to get agency financing you know, it needs to be 90% occupied or more the term value add or reposition what's your take on like the actual terminology yeah and i think that's a great point that, that that you bring up you know certainly we're we're looking at stuff that is stabilized it is you know highly occupied it's it's not value add doesn't have to mean you know the worst part of town in a in a zero zero occupancy property you know it can be something that maybe it's maybe it's just it's just old and dated, but people are living there, but, but you can go fix it up. And that, that's what we look for, you know, good areas, you know, kind of class B neighborhoods where it's a, it's a property that the deal we're closing on in two weeks is it's like 94% occupied. Um, so there's nothing wrong with it. And actually we know that the day we buy it, it's cash flows. So from day one, we're getting cash flow on the property. Now we're going to go in and, and, and renovate it. We are going to reposition it. We are going to rebrand it and update the overall look of it. It was, it was 1983 construction, um, and it looks kind of like a 1983. And we're going to paint the brick. We're going to give it a whole modern look and feel. We're going to make the, the pool update area and, and, and update the interiors. But it's not a property that's in the bad part of town or that's at you know 30%, um, 30% occupancy when we're buying it. Yeah, I think that's really important to point out that is you know, these are the non-recourse loans that we're going after. But I mean, there's guys out there that are going after the huge reposition. I mean, George Newberry, who, who, uh, if you guys want a, a free burn zone book, just shoot me an email, send it out to you. Just need your physical address. But he used to do this. He used to get the worst properties in LA and, and, um, all these inner cities and he'd reposition them and there's a lot of money to be made, but I mean, that's the premise of the book. I mean, when, when things go bad, they go real bad. And, any thought on like any day that you may change your strategy to go after those types of projects or you know, really I, any need to do that? Yeah. I, you know, for us, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I never, never say never. And, but I, I think, you know, there, there's two, two core principles I think that we abide by. Number one, you know, we need to be an absolute expert in what we do as, as the primary sponsor. You know, we need to understand you know, our niche, our asset class, our business plan. And we, we need to, we need to just be a, an absolute expert on that. So I think in that sense, you know, we're very focused on you know, buying these more stabilized, but value add opportunities versus a complete repositioning. I think the other thing that, that draws me to you know, what we're doing and, and it builds on what we were doing on the smaller scale is it's a good mix of cash flow and appreciation or, you know, forcing appreciation that, the, the total repositioning, I've got a buddy that, that's doing one right now in San Antonio. It's like a 75 unit that they're taking down to zero occupancy, you know, it was like a, a drug den. They, they had to evict everybody and, you know, 
it, it, they, there was gunshots and after they took over and blood all over the place. I mean, it's, it's a rough, rough deal. Um, that's not too dissimilar than just a, a, you know, brand new construction. So, you know, they're, they are riskier. They, they've got maybe a little bit higher upside, but there's, you're not getting any cash flow on them. You know, you're going to invest in it. It's going to be, you know, two, three, four years before you know if it's going to work. Um, and it's just, you know, you can, you can be super, super successful with it. You're a lot more subject to market cycles and what's, what's happening in the market when that thing's actually ready to sell versus, you know, we're buying a deal that's that, like I said, 94% occupied. Now we know the day one, when we take it over, it's got cash flow because we've seen their, their financials. Um, and now we're just going to go incrementally make that better over the first you know, 12 to 18 months. And so you get a nice, you do get a nice return, uh, but it's, it's balanced with some of this sort of security that there's cash flow. You know, class C multifamily, you know, minor reposition is, you know, hundred percent in five years. What, do you, what would be the IRRs or returns that you're seeing on those, some of those other more riskier projects? I think you see those that can, you know, they're certainly over 20, maybe even 25. I mean, you know, I, I think IRR is, is a tricky number. I know everybody uses it to evaluate, you know, and kind of de- you know, apples to apples comparison on, on how these things are going to perform. But it's also a number that's just kind of a marketing tactic. I mean, and, and you know this, like we could tweak any, any host of, of factors and, you know, said, well, I only invest in 18, you know, plus IRR. Well, I could, I could show you how this can be an 18, you know, I might be violating some of my principles in, in, in underwriting and, um, you know, it's, it's, but I, I can make it a, say whatever I want it to. I think you've got to be, again, like very, very grounded and very conservative in how you're underwriting deals. Um, but I think, you know, that that's just a caveat on IRR. But I do think that you typically, you know, if, if me and I, I've done some some kind of infill, you know, ground up spec work where I've been an investor, um, and I, you know, I want to see, you know, twenty five percent plus, you know, chance that I'm going to double my money in kind of two years. Um, so, and, and I think that that is out there, but it, it is riskier. You're not getting any cash flow, and you know, you got to get in and out before the market starts to soften. All right. Yeah. Just are they? Is it high return? Or is it just a shorter period of hold time? Uh, I mean, I think those are, are kind of one and the same, you know, it's, it's, if you're doing a, a big reposition and you're taking a, you know, hundred unit complex down to zero occupancy, I mean, it's, that's, that's going to take you 18 months probably to do that. Um, and then you got to get it stabilized and you got to get it occupied. So you, you've got some financials, so somebody else can come buy it. So I think it's probably best case, a two year scenario, um, that you know you're not getting any, any cash flow on for that whole two years, um, but you you might get out of it. You know earlier, we're, we're our deals are typically five year you know kind of horizons where is our is our business plan that we'll we'll hold them and underwrite to a five year hold. For, so it's not a it's not a fix and flip mentality. All right. All right. Well, final question here is the uh, the twenty Robbins identifies two large composites that we could take showing to gain perfection at. The first is our fulfillment. The second is the sign of achievement. So, if you die tomorrow, uh, what would uh, your kids hear? What is your first secret or hack for the science of achievement? Any secret habits or morning rituals, nighttime rituals? Yeah, you know, I kind of back to that monthly goal. Um, of, you know, the morning ritual of, of getting up early, kind of exercising. I, I, I come in and, and I, I I lay out my gratitudes, you know, and, and really focus on my mindset. Try to be as positive as I can. Thankful for the flexibility that I do have in my life. The fact that I can go, you know, read to my daughter's class, and also kind of plan out my day. You know, what are the what are the key things I need to get done today? Um, and I try to do that every single morning. Um, so I, I think that's. That's a big, I, I was not doing that when I was you know, in corporate America. I was kind of doing the rush out of the house, get to work, figure it out. Um, and I think that's been a big shift and, and a key to, to our success in, in this sort of entrepreneur world is, is getting up and doing that on a daily basis. How long do you figure that takes you every morning? Uh, you know, all in all, it's probably like an hour and 15 minutes, you know, by the time I, I if I factor in my run and everything, um, you know, but it's, I sit down for probably half an hour and, you know, kind of go through my, my day and kind of plan out, you know, do some of my, my gratitude and just kind of, you know, get grounded for the day that that's probably half an hour. And then I go, you know, go run, come back. So um, you call it an hour, hour and 15 minutes. 
do you do you come back at the end of the day and kind of see if you got those big items done or is that no not not I usually do that the next morning. You know, at the end of the day, I've either I'm either deciding I'm not going to do anything tonight and I'm going to hang out with my wife and we're going to, you know, watch a show or connect and and I really try to turn it off or I've been working and I've just kind of worked until I've just hey, I need to get to bed. Um so I don't I don't usually take the time at night to go back and do it. It's usually the next morning and if there's something I didn't get done, it's on the top of my list for the next day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I've bought those little journals that, you know, they have the morning and the nighttime thing and I just mm-hmm. never really found it to work and I yeah really i did too the the like the five minute journal yeah the i'd go back journal and, and all yeah those. yeah my morning ones are always filled up in the nighttime i just I, i'd never just it didn't work doesn't work for me i'm i think i'm just not i'm just done at the end of the day yeah and it just gets repetitive too and it's like and yeah all right so what is your secret or hack to the art fulfillment uh you know i, I think for me that's i, I go back to being sort of being an independent entrepreneur that that can organize his his life and his day, you know, around ways that 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 he needs to, you know. So reference being able to go, you know, read at my daughter's school. I try to volunteer there. I I go pop popcorn once a month. You know, I, I carve out some time to go see my dad. Um, you know, I think it's it's just having that flexibility in my day and being able to construct my day without having to, you know, check other people's schedules too much and without having to request vacation that really, I think, fulfills me in a way that, you know, I know that I'll be doing this business, you know, and kind of living this lifestyle for the rest of my life because I love what I do, but I also have the flexibility to, to do what's really important to me. And that that's, you know, help take care of my family, um, you know, make sure my dad's doing, doing well and kind of goes back to the initial why if we got into this business in the first place. All right. Well, anything we miss, you want to get your um, contact information out there? Yeah. You know, people can feel free to contact me. Uh, your company is Wildhorn Capital. Uh, we've got a website that's www.wildhorncap.com. Um, you can go on there and we've, we've got some, some articles you can download and you can reach out there. You can also email me. It's just andrew at wildhorncap.com uh, or find me. I'm, I'm pretty active on bigger pockets and, and LinkedIn and stuff, but uh, yeah, I love talking about real estate and would love to talk to any of your listeners. All right. Well, thanks for uh, coming on, Andrew. Appreciate it. Yeah, Lane, this was great. I enjoyed it and look forward to connecting soon. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.